started. This is, this is the uh, Forerunner School class, understanding the end times. And you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited about this class. Um, the, the, this class really, what is the goal of it is to understand the context for how God's ultimate intention is going to be fulfilled at the end of the age. That, that's really, God's ultimate goal is not just to bring out the Antichrist or uh, to restore Israel or to release judgments or allow the heart of Babylon to rise up. God's ultimate intention is going to be fulfilled. And that's what the end times to me are all about. And so I, I just want to hopefully from this class bring in a very new perspective of the end times. And so let's, let's start by turning in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, because what we want to do is we want to talk about what uh, the need for insight and understanding. There's, there's such a need right now for insight and understanding. I don't know about you, but there is, there is truly mass confusion right now in the body of Christ about the end times. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but the, the body of Christ right now is so confused about what really is happening, what's happening right now, uh, and then what's happening in the end times. But Matthew 24, 37 through 39, and I, I've shared this before many times, but it's one of those scripture verses that you sit back and go, oh man, that's kind of a sobering thing, is Jesus is talking about the end times. In fact, he's answering the question the disciples have asked in verse 1, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus says, as he says in verse 37, the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Well, what was that like? Well, as in those days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Here's verse 39. This, is, this really just strikes me. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. Oh, man, think about that. That's sobering. The majority of the world in the days of Noah had, I mean, except for maybe eight people, because Noah was warning them about what was coming, the majority of the world had zero clue. I mean, we're talking about millions, if not, you know, even into the billions of people in the days of Noah. It, it, uh, millions and millions of people had zero understanding. They were just eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, just clueless to the days they were living in. Jesus says they did not understand until the, day, the flood came and took them away. Oh, man. And, and, he's, and he's saying this, the days of leading to the coming of the Son of Man will be just like that. But it doesn't have to be like that for the church. It's not meant to be like that for the church. The church is meant to be a voice that gives understanding to many people. In fact, if you're in the forerunner school, God's raising you up as a messenger to give understanding to many people. Now, that might mean you're giving understanding to your friends and family. It might mean God calls you to preach in the nations and raises up a platform. We don't know what that will be, but God has called each of us to give understanding to the many. Let's, let's turn now to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, verse 33 this is, this is a scripture verse that drove me or has driven me for many years. It's Daniel 11, 33. He's talking about the end times. And he says, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. We won't read the next part of the verse where they fall by the sword and captivity and fire. So we'll ignore that for now, all right? So I want to keep you in a good mood. But God wants to raise up people, voices, messengers who would have insight into the end of the age, insight into what's going to unfold, and, the, and as, a, as a messenger, God would anoint you to give understanding to the many. God wants to give you understanding so you can give others understanding. It's not meant for you to become, you know, sometimes when you get into the end times, it almost becomes like a game where you, you get excited about all the different event, events and you're putting together a puzzle. God doesn't want us just to have all that understanding to keep it to ourselves. The Lord wants us to give it and release it outward to many people. We've got to be a voice that is going to tell people 
the times we live in and what God's going to be doing. Now let's turn over one, one chapter here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. Daniel is, is writing, again he's, again he's talking about the end of the age. And he's asking the Lord a question. He says, I heard, but I could not understand. And he said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? In other words, Daniel has had these prophetic events or these pr prophetic revelations. And he's like, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean you're showing me? These, these events you're showing me, these prophetic, you know, these beasts and all these crazy things you're showing me. What do these things mean? And in verse 9, he said, go your way, Daniel. For these words are concealed until this and sealed up until the time of the end. We're living in the time of the end. See, we're living in the, the end of the age. I'm convinced we're living at the end of the age. Now that should make us happy, not sad. See, a lot of people, a lot of times you go, we're living at the end of the age, and I go, oh dear God, no. <laughs> I'm saying, dear God, yes. This is our finest hour. Heaven is looking down going, you have been chosen to live in this time period. How many of them in the great cloud of witnesses are jealous of us for living in the period we're living in? We literally are living in the time when the bride is going to make herself ready. We can be part of that. How incredible. We're living in the church's finest hour. If you've got a mindset of like, dear God, let it not be true that we're living at the end of the age, I want to change your mindset for a second. The end times are the greatest time to be alive. I'm not saying it's going to be, the e it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. It's the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. So we're going to have to have a lot of emotional ability to sustain the times we live in. Because everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but the bride is going to be made ready. God's ultimate intention is going to be fulfilled. I'm telling you, we are living right at the threshold of those things taking place. Amen. Part of the privilege of living at the end of the age is God is unveiling to us the mysteries that for ages the prophets, even the angels, have longed to look into. God is unlocking end time mysteries. God is unlocking end time revelation. And so we want to be those who have that end time re uh, revelation, that end time understanding. Now, just for those who don't know me very well, just especially for those who are on our foreigner school, everyone here hopefully knows me well, but just to give you a little bit of uh, insight into my journey, I began to study the end times about 25 plus years ago. I just, it, it had to be something God supernaturally gave me, this desire to study the end times. I mean, really, I thought everybody was interested in the end times, and I found out no one is but a few. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I, I went deep. I mean, I, I just had this obsession to know the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and the book of Isaiah and all the Old Testament prophets. You know, I had this insatiable hunger and thirst. I've got to know these things. I've got to know. I, I mean, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours studying commentaries and listening to end time teachings and stuff for 25 plus years. And so I'm going to try to make this um, as simple as I can. It can get really complicated. I am going to make it simple for you so you can understand. I'm going to take all the bad teaching, hopefully, the bad views, the confusion, the complexity, all that stuff out of the picture so you can have clarity and understanding. But I've got with me here this book. This book, I've, I've told the story here at our church, but I'll tell it just to the others who haven't heard the story. But this book is about, this is probably three to five pounds. It's about 18 years ago, this time, Angie and I were in England, and we were taking a train from England to Scotland. And I, I just remember, this is where I got the revelation of how intense I am. I might need to tone down my intensity about the end times. But we were on a train from England going to Scotland, we were on vacation. And so this is the book I brought in my backpack. It's about five pounds, and my back was hurting. And I'm like, man, my back's hurting. And Angie's like, well, maybe because you're hauling around a five-pound hardcover book in your backpack. And I was like, yeah, that's probably right. But 
Anyway, I'll just never forget is we're, we're taking this train, and you know the, the English are so proper, and you know they drink their tea, their pinky p finger points out, everything's proper, everything's done right, you know, all that stuff. And anyway, we're on the train, and I just, I'm not even thinking, I just pull this book out, and I just plop it down on the table, and I start reading, and Angie's like, I, I mean, this is back in our, and Angie would, would agree with this, back at when we first got married, Angie did not want to have anything to do with the end times. I mean, she just... I mean, you know, she was all faith. We need to have faith. I mean, she, and she would, she's not in here, but she would agree with what I'm saying. She's since then changed quite a bit, but I guess you have to, to be married to me. But anyway, she was all faith. We're just going to believe God and, you know, we're going to believe this. We're going to believe that. Faith, faith, faith. And anyway, so then I pulled this out and I could tell she was so embarrassed and she pulls out her English Garden magazine. So I'm studying about like the beast in the book of Revelation, seven heads, ten horns, the great harlot riding the beast. You know, I'm studying all this stuff. And so and then Angie pulls out her English Garden magazine and she's looking at, you know, fancy, you know, beautiful, quaint English cottages and flowers and all this stuff. And I just realized, okay, I'm kind of intense. <laughs> I need to tone it down a little bit. And I have, but anyway, that gives you the, the journey I've been on. I mean, I've been on a journey to understand the end of the age. I really want to know the, the mysteries of the end times. And uh, as I mentioned, the end times are truly the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. They're the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. It's going to be the most challenging time in history... If anyone tells you it's not, they're lying to you. It is going to challenge us to the core. And at the same time, it is going to be the most exciting time in human history. Now, a lot of us don't have the emotional ability to handle those two things, but, it is, but we need to because it, this is the church's finest hour. God's eternal purpose is going to be fulfilled. The great cloud of witnesses are watching us, seeing how we're going to do. See, the time we live in, I want, I want to say this. I want you to approach this class, this study, as if Jesus is, is, as if all the events necessary for Jesus to come back are completed by the end of this decade. So by 2029, just for a minute, or 2030, whatever, just say by 2030, everything is in place for the Lord to come back. I want you to approach that class, this class as if Jesus could come back in the next 10 to 15 years. Because if you think that the Lord's coming is like 50 years or outside of your lifetime, you'll look at this stuff and you'll be like, it's irrelevant, it's unpractical. I, I think the times we live in right now have shown us, hey, we, you know, we really are living at the end of the age. We really are. The end time things we read about in Scripture are coming to pass, and they're coming to pass quickly. And so I want to just encourage you to take this class as if you are being prepared and equipped for the return of Jesus in the next decade or the next, you know, between the next 10 to 20 years. And I believe with all my heart that could happen. I really, really believe with all my heart that could happen. I understand there's all, been all those wacky predictions. I'm not making a prediction Jesus is coming back then. I'm just saying, and when I look at the signs of the times, when I look at the end times, when I look at everything that must happen, I'm telling you, we are living at that time when all those events, all the things prophesied are coming into alignment right now. We really could be in the final decade that has to have everything set up for Jesus to come back. And so I want to encourage you, take this class as if you are, pre as, as you, as if you are preparing for his return and, and make it practical and relevant to you. The other thing I want to encourage you to do as we start this class is to be a good Berean. Now that, that's from Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul goes to... Berea, and he preaches, and all the Bereans there were humble, and they were teachable, but they didn't just say, well, I'm going to accept blindly, and I'm going to be gullible about whatever you say. I'm going to take what you say, and I'm going to go into Scripture, and I'm going to examine, is this true? Is what you are saying true? Is what you are saying accurate? You know, it talks about the, the Bereans. They were noble-minded, but here's what they did. They examined the scriptures thoroughly to see if it was actually true. 
See, they went in and said, okay, is this actually true? Is what Paul is saying actually true? Do the scriptures align with this? I want to tell you when it comes to the end times, a major mistake so many have made, I have made as well, because there's some complexity in it, a lot of people in the body of Christ have just taken what their favorite teacher on TV has said, what their favorite prophet has said, what their favorite apostle has said, whatever the book is they've written, and they just have blindly said that's true because they're smart, they're eloquent, they're intelligent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I want to encourage you, don't go that path. Go into the scriptures yourself and see is if what I am saying is true. Don't just believe it just because I say it. Take it back to the scriptures and examine it thoroughly. Be a good Berean. Now, that, that does not mean come up and every point I make, get into a debate with me and like, well, you said this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Have a teachable heart. Have a humble heart. Have a, have a meek heart that receives it eagerly but go into the scriptures and examine it thoroughly. Is this really true? Is what I'm saying very uh, actually true? The next thing I'm going to say is having studied the end times, and I'm going to introduce a big word to you. We want to use it quite a bit, but it's the word eschatology. Eschatology, you want to say that. It's a, it means the study of the end times, eschatology. If you want to impress your friends, just throw out the word, yeah, well, we're just talking about eschatology at church. It really will impress your friends. But, you know, it, it, it's, I don't really like to use big words, but this is a big word we do need to use, eschatology. It comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, and the Greek word logi, which means study of. So it's from the two Greek words, eschatos and logi, which eschatology means study of the last times or study of the end times. And so as I've gotten into eschatology, what I've seen is there's three groups of people. There's a group like me who are crazy, and you're probably going, you're crazy. I am a little crazy. You're crazy, and you're passionate about the end times, and you, that's all you want to talk about. And, you know, I, I do talk a lot about the end times. So I'm not going not going to say I don't, but I do. We're passionate about the end times. There's a second group, and it's probably the largest who are indifferent, or who, I'll say it this way, they, they're indifferent or afraid of the end times. And they're basically like, do not talk about the end times. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to put my head in the sand. I'm going to ignore it. Ignorance is bliss. It's better if I don't know. It's better. i will be much more happy if I don't know. That is a lie, by the way. That is a huge lie. We have got to know. I mean, I think Mike Bickle is estimated as 150 chapters that talk about the end times. God did not just put all that in the scriptures just so that we could put our head in the sand and say, I'm going to ignore it so I can have happiness in my life. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get depressed if you read the end times, but it's in there because we have the, the last generation has to be equipped to know the end times. And so there's a second group. The, they're indifferent. Their ignorance is bliss. I, I see the end times as impractical. It's not really relevant to my life. And so anytime you bring up the subject of the end times, they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. Or maybe they're motivated by fear. Maybe they're motivated by anxiety. I don't want anything to do with that. And the third group, which this group is actually increasing in the days we live in, is what Peter warned about in his epistle. He said, in the last days mockers and scoffers are going to rise up. We're going to talk about that in the next session. And I've seen it over the past 10 years, because I, I, I wrote a class for our, our life school uh, ministry for training pastors in Africa. I wrote a, a class about the end times about 10 years ago, and the, the mocking and the scoffing related to eschatology was not like it is today, not even close. It has risen up big time, especially with the spread of social media. Mockers and scoffers rising up who anytime you say, talk about, the, and this is not just coming from the world, this is coming from the church. It's coming from within the church. It's what Peter warned about. Peter, as an apostle, warned and he said, in the last days, mockers and scoffers are going to rise up. We're living in that time. We're living in that day when mockers and scoffers are rising within the church. And they're saying, where is the sign of his coming? 
Where is the sign of his return? You've been talking about this eschatology and this rapture and this end time stuff and all you've done is created fear and you're just sitting here scaring the bride of Christ and da 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 whatever. I mean, that kind of stuff is going on. Mocking and scoffing has risen up. That's the third group. And that group is increasing, by the way, right now. But I found something that happened. 2020 changed everything. <laughs> Um, what I just described was what, what was uh, a reality in 2019 or actually 2020 up until the month of March. Once March 2020 got here, everything changed. You still had the group of people who are passionate to know about the end times like me. Now what I have found is the indifferent and those who are afraid or timid about the end times are now asking questions. Okay, now tell me again, are we living in the end times? What's really going to happen? You know, I, I kind of ignored that stuff before. I didn't think it was very relevant. But now the coronavirus has come. Are we, is Jesus coming soon? You know, tell me again about this Antichrist thing and this rapture thing. Are we going to be taken out of here? Or, you know, what's going to happen? And God's judgments and, you know, what's, what about Israel? And what is their role? And all these different things. That indifferent group has now been awakened to say, I need to know about the end times. It, 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 for the most part, that big group, that second group is the biggest group. Very few of them now are saying, you know, I, don't, I still don't want to know about the end times. They're very curious. God has awakened a hunger in that group to know about the end times. But at the same time, that third group has become even more vocal. And I'm seeing it all over the place. Relax. A great revival's coming that's going to transform nations. Relax. It's, it's not, things are not getting better or worse. They're actually getting better. Look at the stats. Things are getting better. You're negative. Those end time people, they're negative. They're judgmental. They're fire and brimstone. They're da 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 da. They don't know God's love. They don't go know God's goodness. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, it's definitely rising up. The mockers and scoffers once 2020 got here, have intensified, saying, relax. And, and it's driven, we're going to get into this, it's driven by very bad doctrine of an eschatology. We're going to get into what that is in a later session. But they're rising up and they're saying, you know, just relax. It's not the end of the world. It's the end of the world as you know it. God's about to relieve, release a great revival. And I do believe God is going to release a great revival. I believe God's going to release a great awakening. I'll talk about that in a, in a later session. But it's not meant, listen, it's not meant to transform culture. It's meant to transform the bride. The revival God is bringing is a bridal revival. It's to prepare the bride of Christ for the second coming of Jesus. It's to prepare the bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is not meant to transform culture. That's coming when Jesus comes back and the bride comes back with her. This revival is a bridal revival. I think Mike Bickle used that term, bridal revival. I love that term. It is a bridal revival meant to awaken the bride, not to transform the culture. Now, if the culture gets transformed, I'm all for that, but that's, I don't believe God's intention in it. You don't see that in Scripture, and we'll talk about that. So that's, that's kind of where we are is from 2020. Is, that's the boat we live in. Now, if you're in the first group, like me, I want to, and this is what I did. When I, when I got ready to teach the end times for this class, I've studied it for 25 plus years, I said, okay, I am going to start this with a blank slate. I, I've come in to this with a lot of teaching, a lot of commentaries, a lot of things I've taught as well. I'm pushing delete on everything, coming in with a blank slate. I want to be humble about what I think is the, going to happen. I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't want to think I have all the answers. I want to come with fresh eyes into the scriptures and say, is this, you know, tell me, what, what is the truth? Don't you want the truth? I want the truth. I don't want to believe any doctrine that's not true. And so I did that. I, and I'll get into that in the next session. But I did that. I want to encourage you to do, to do the same thing. Don't be dogmatic thinking you've got every single thing figured out. Be humble. 
be teachable. See, it's more important to be ready than to be right. So what good is it if you have every doctrine figured out about the end of the age and you nailed it perfectly, but your heart is not on fire for God? I mean, what good is it if you've got everything in eschatology laid out perfectly, but you are not intimate with Jesus? It does you no good whatsoever. So it's way more important to be ready than to be right. See, when Jesus was talking about the end times, he didn't say, get your doctrine perfect, get your doctrine perfect, get your doctrine perfect. He said over and over, be ready. Be ready. So if you're in the first group, humble yourself. Don't think you've got all the answers. Just come to it with a, with a blank slate and fresh eyes. If you're one of those who've been in the indifferent group and now you're being awakened just a little bit more, I want to read a couple scriptures to you here. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And I want you to see what, what Matthew tells us as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, 15, writing his gospel from the, from the Lord's perspective. He's writing down what Jesus said. He talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet. We're going to get into that in a later session. Standing in the holy place. Here's what, here's what Matthew says as an apostolic commandment. He says, let the reader understand. In other words, what, what Matthew is telling us is he's saying, if you are reading the Olivet Discourse, which Matthew 24 is called the Olivet Discourse, if you're reading Matthew 24, you need to actually take a step back and read the book of Daniel. You cannot understand the end times. You cannot understand Matthew chapter 24 until you understand the book of Daniel. In other words, Matthew is telling us, to, if you really want to know what's going to happen at the end of the age, you've got to become a student of eschatology, especially the book of Daniel. So if you're indifferent, if you're just kind of not really into the end times, it is an apostolic commandment, especially to us who live at the end of the age. Understand the book of Daniel. And we're going to go through the book of Daniel in a lot of detail. The second thing I want you to turn to is Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Is, you know, you, you think about the book of Revelation, and there's such a bad negative perception on the book of Revelation. I mean, most of the church today just says, we're not touching that with a 10 foot pole. We are not going to talk about the book of Revelation. It's too negative. It's too depressing. We'll get sad. We'll just, I don't want to be afraid or whatever. But I want to actually change the, the paradigm of that to say, look what, look what John writes. And he's writing as, also as an apostle from heaven with this heavenly revelation. He says, bless is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. In other words, John is telling us, you will experience mind-blowing spiritual blessings if you read the book of Revelation. Now that is a, is a paradox, because we think, I'm not getting near that book, it's too negative, it's too depressing, it's too much doom and gloom, and the Lord's like, that's the exact opposite of what I'm saying. And I found that to be so often so true. The book that has blessed me spiritually more than any other book perhaps is the book of Revelation. Because of this very promise right here. God has made a pronouncement in the book of Revelation. You will experience blessings on your life if you read and study and obey the book of Revelation. And so if you're in that second group, indifferent, become, an end time, become a student of end time prophecy. Study these things for yourself. The scriptures talk about study to show yourself approved unto God. Each of us have a responsibility. Now catch this. We each have a responsibility for ourselves of what we believe. You cannot stand before the Lord and say, well, this is what Brian taught me. That is not going to fly before the Lord. He's going to say, well, what did you study? 
And so what would happen if we stood before the Lord and we were misled or deceived because we just ignored, what, 150 chapters in the, in the scriptures about the end times because we thought it was too hard or too depressing or too complicated or whatever, irrelevant. That's not going to fly. We've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So I want to encourage you, become a student of end time prophecy. Now, if you're one of the mockers and scoffers, I don't even want to know what you're thinking about me right now. But if you're one of those mockers and scoffers, you're probably not even listening to this. If you are, you're probably making negative comments on YouTube or whatever. But I just want to encourage you, as a mocker and a scoffer, ask yourself some real honest questions. Have you believe, do you now believe what you believe, not because the Word of God clearly teaches it, but because your experience has been, you've seen the extremes. You've seen a wacky prediction that Jesus is going to come back in 1988. I remember, I've told the story before, but I remember I was growing up and I was in a life of rebellion as a sophomore in high school, and maybe a freshman or sophomore, I think it was a sophomore in high school, and I, was, I literally thought I was having a heart attack. I thought I was dying, and I remember mom said, well, you know what, you need to read this book. The book was 88 Reasons Jesus is Going to Come Back in 1988. And so I read that book, and uh, it scared, literally scared the hell out of me, literally, for about two weeks, and then it went away. But my point is, Jesus did not come back in 1988, obviously. And so many people look at that now and go, That's, they don't want anything to do with the end times because of wacky predictions people have said. Well, he's coming back because of this or about that. Don't let the extremes of the, in the end time teaching movement cause you to re, now cling to think, uh, teachings, errors that are not in scripture. Just because someone has taken an extreme and, and taken the, the scripture and gone to some extreme and gone, we're going to hide out in the bunker until the Antichrist, until Jesus raptures us. We're going to go hide out from the Antichrist or whatever it would be. All the extremes, you, know, you, you, you hear about it in the Jesus people movement when uh, the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It was a multi-million selling book. And everyone back then was like, Jesus is coming back in our lifetime. And he didn't come back in their lifetime. And they sold everything. And they moved to the mountains waiting for Jesus to come back. And he didn't. And a lot of people were burned and disillusioned by that because they thought Jesus is coming back. And, you know, the extremes, the fringe element, don't let the fringe element lead you to eschatology or beliefs about eschatology that are not based in scripture. In fact, a lot of the people now teaching preterism, which is the belief that all the prophecies or most of the prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD, a lot of those uh, teaching that preterism or a good a number of those were burned in that movement, that Jesus people movement because of the extremes. Don't allow a belief to come into your mind, and you might even think that uh, you've got it all figured out, and I'm going to address preterism in a later session. I just want to encourage you to rethink, rethink, reevaluate what you believe. So, again, I've talked about it. There is mass confusion right now when it comes to the end times. Mass confusion. And my goal in this class is to take something that's really, really complicated and make it very clear and simple for you to understand. I'm, I'm trying my hardest to reduce all the complexity, and I want to instill within you an unclouded vision of how God's ultimate intention will be fulfilled at the end of the age. Let, let me turn to, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I've already talked about that. So now let me talk about seven reasons why eschatology is important. Seven reasons why it's important to study the end times. Number one, Jesus taught us to know the signs of his return so that we would be prepared. He doesn't want us to know about the end times so we're going to be intelligent. He doesn't want us to know about the end times so we can be smart and win a debate with our friends. He wants us to understand the end times so we can be prepared. It's more important to be ready than to be right. And so Jesus gave a parable in Matthew 24, verse 32 through 34, and he says, learn the parable of the fig tree. When it begins to ripen, you know summer is near. He says, when you see all of these things, 
when you see all the things I listed in Matthew chapter 24, when you begin to see those things come to pass, know that I am near. In other words, what he's saying is, when you see the signs of the end times beginning to come to pass, use that as a motivation to you to be ready. In fact, in Matthew 24, he talks over and over about the need to be ready. Be ready. Be prepared. Be like virgins, and that's Matthew 25. Be like virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom. Watch for him. Wait for him. Get oil for your lamp. Be like those who are waiting or anticipating a thief coming in the night. Being ready. Be ready for those things. Be ready. Be like the days of Noah. Noah spent however many years building an ark. He was, he was anticipating the end of that age coming, and he was anticipating the judgments of God coming. Be ready. Be watchful. Be anticipating those things. See, the end times, we need to study the end times so we can be prepared, so we can be ready. Understanding the end times is no longer optional. See, a lot of times, I, I believe up until 2020, for the most part in the body of Christ, there's been this view that, well, the, under, the end times are kind of an optional thing, and you know, we're not going to really get into debates about this or that. We're just going to see how everything pans out. Well, I'm telling you right now, understanding the end times is no longer optional. It is essential. It is essential for us to know the signs of the end times so our hearts can be ready for him. Jesus looked at the, the religious leaders of his day and he said, you know, you can tell weather patterns and you can predict this and you can predict that. But you do not or you cannot even discern the signs of the times. I believe the Lord would say the same type thing to leaders today and to the body of Christ today. You cannot discern the signs of the times. The majority of the, of the church right now, most of the church right now, thinks that doesn't even have a clue that Jesus might come back soon. I don't say the majority. Some, probably half, half is probably more accurate. About half of the church is just like, Jesus is not coming back soon. We've been hearing that forever. We've been hearing that for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. He's not coming back soon. Relax, okay? Get on with your life. And I'm not, I'm not saying go to the extreme, but you get what I'm saying. God wants us to understand the end times. It's no longer optional. It's essential for the times we live in. Hosea 4.6 says that my people, not the world, my people, God's people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. We're destroyed by a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge is destroying us. I believe at the end of the age, a lack of knowledge about the end times is going to destroy or cause many to fall away from the faith. We've got to know the end. I'm telling you, it is a critical thing right now. In this moment in time, while we still have liberty and freedom, why we still have the ability to read our Bibles without persecution, I want to plead with you, study the scriptures to know what it teaches about the end times. Amen? The second reason we should study the end times is understanding the end times motivates us to seek the Lord with all of our hearts and live completely for him. Uh, Proverbs 29, 18 talks about without a vision, without vision, people are undisciplined. Without vision, people live without restraint. See, there's something about having a vision of the end of the age and how the events are going to unfold that motivates us right now. If you begin with the end in mind, how the Lord's coming is going to uh, unfold and work your way back to where you are right now, what it does, and I've seen this over my life over and over and over. If I will truly see what the end of the age talks about, it motivates me now to break free of the mundane and the boring and just the rigorous stuff of pressing in to seek God. It motivates me to break through that to have an intimate relationship with him. It motivates me to seek the Lord uh, right now wholeheartedly. And it does. It do absolutely does. Joel talked about that in Joel chapter 2. You see 11 verses where Joel is warning about the day of the Lord, which is, we're going to, you'll see it, it's the last three and a half years before Jesus comes back. The day of the Lord, 
and how the day of the Lord was a catalyst to say, even now, return to me with fasting, weeping, and mourning. See, it was a vision of the day of the Lord that motivated the people in Joel's day to return wholeheartedly to God. And not, you know, the 19, the 88 reasons Jesus is coming back in 1988, that motivated me to seek God for about two weeks. It really does motivate us to seek Him. Now, hopefully it will be more than two weeks, but you get the point. Number three is understanding the end times inspires us to repent and to overcome. In Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, before John is shown Revelation 6 through 19, before John is shown the unfolding of the events of the end times, Jesus comes with seven messages to seven churches, urging those seven churches, repent, overcome, wake up, in other words, before the Lord unfolds to us the revelation of what's going to take place, he comes first to his church and he says, these things are going to happen. These, these events are going to happen. Now I'm coming to you. In the light of the end time events breaking out, repent, overcome, get your heart right with God. Overcome losing your first love. Overcome Jezebel. Overcome false teaching. Overcome fear of tribulation. Overcome apathy and indifference and uh, uh, sleepiness and slumber. Overcome those things. Number four, understanding the end times guards our hearts from offense at God. Now that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. I'm telling you right now. Understanding the end times guards our hearts from offense at God. Man, we need to hear that. And, and you know the scripture that Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 10, many will be offended at the end of the age. I mean, we're, I mean, are we not living in that time right now? You can hardly say anything right now without triggering something in someone. Just, you know, as a pastor... I mean, you know, that's, you know, it's so hard. I mean, because there's a, you know, one little thing here, one little thing there can just trigger people. I mean, we're, we're so, we've gotten so offendable, haven't we? But Jesus is talking about guard our hearts from offense at God. And so the, the end of the, that's why it's so important right now. We've got a reprieve right now, somewhat of a reprieve, I guess, maybe, somewhat, at least up for a month. We've got a reprieve right now before things get way, go back to the intensity level. And, and I think we're going to have, we're going to have a, a, a longer period that before the actual end time events themselves break out in fullness, we'll have a bit of a reprieve. It's, the window's shrinking, though. The window's shrinking. I want to encourage you, get your heart prepared for the end time. So we don't become offended at God. I'm telling you, the majority are going to become offended at God. How could a God, especially when God releases his judgments, Satan releases his rage, man's sin increases to a level like we've never seen, and natural disasters break out like we've um, never witnessed before. The world is going to look up their finger and say, how could a God of love allow this? How could a God of love, a God of goodness, allow such suffering? I thought you said God was good. I thought you said God was kind. How could he do these kinds of things to the people he created? We need to work through that tension right now. That's, there's a theological tension between Jesus as the lion and Jesus as the lamb. There's a theological tension between God's kindness and his severity. There's a theological tension between God's goodness and his judgments. The church does not handle these theological tensions very well at all. They go to one extreme or the other. They go either to the severity side or the, or the goodness side without, without allowing the, the scriptures themselves to, to, to bring them to that place of the messy middle where we can handle and embrace the tension on both sides. Jesus as the lion, Jesus as the lamb, Jesus as the judge, Jesus as the shepherd. See, we've got to know both of those. We've got to balance that tension. And so 
it, I'm telling you, it takes some time to work through that. It takes some time to work through that. How could God do some of these things? You read in the book of Revelation, he's going to, you know, I think it's going to be about half of the world are going to be killed by his end time judgments. I mean, how do you wrestle through that? The days of Noah are like this coming of the Son of Man. I think there's, you know, whatever the number was, let's just say there was 5 million or 8, let's just say there was 10 million people alive in Noah's day, whatever the number was, 10 million people. Only 8 survived. God's judgments killed tens of millions of people. How can you wrestle with that tension, uh, that theological tension that God's good and he's severe, God's kind and he's a judge? See, we, we, need, to, we need to wrestle through that before the shaking really starts to intensify. Amen? We've got to work through that because God wants us to be a voice to those uh, who want to be offended at God, who are raging at God, saying, why would you allow this to people you created? You are not good. And we've got to be a voice that says, no, God is absolutely good. God is absolutely just. God is absolutely wise. And we've got to be people that have the answers for the world who are just, just you know, swirling in confusion. Number five. This is a big one as well. Uh, Matthew 24, or, or we'll, well, actually, I won't even read it. Uh, number five, understanding the end times keeps us from deception. Really important. You know, the Lord said in, in Matthew 24, he said, verse 4 and 5, he said, they asked him, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And, the, and Jesus, his first answer, listen, his first answer was, see to it, no one misleads you. Then he says, many are going to come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they're going to mislead many. And I've said this over and over again. They're not going to be coming. Who, right, who in the right mind would believe some guy with a beard, with a white cloak on with a staff or whatever saying I'm Jesus Christ come and worship me I mean you, you would be I mean I guess our country is kind of insane right now but I mean you'd have to be really out of your mind to fall for that you know that's not what the Lord is saying the Lord is saying many many Christian pastors many Christian teachers many Christian apostles many Christian prophets are going to come in my name. They're going to come in my name saying, I am Christ. In other words, they're going to say, Jesus Christ is, is God. He's the eternal Son of God. Well, I agree with that. They're going to believe in the Word of God as the, word, as, as the Scriptures. But their, their teaching is going to inject error and deception in those they influence. Especially, this is, I think this is probably the Lord even looked into our day and saw the rise of YouTube and social media. Especially with the rise of social media, allowing this stuff just to spread. You know, they say if you repeat a lie long enough, people start believing it. And people, you know, people right now are believing all kinds of nonsense that, that they think the scriptures teach when it's just not there. That's one of the reasons we've got to understand the end times because... False teachers, now they may not be false teachers in terms of not being Christians. They, Christian teachers having uh, de deception about certain doctrines are going to lead God's people astray. Deception is rising up. Deception is rising up. So we've got to understand the end times so we're not deceived. One of the hallmarks of the end of the age is deception. In fact, uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it talks about an apostasy. Before the Antichrist comes onto the scene, or, or be, sorry, before the Lord returns, there's coming both a great apostasy and the revealing of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. I'm telling you, you know, we've, we've seen a measure of a falling away from the faith already. We're going to see way more than that. Way, way more is coming. And we're going to get into that in one session. The harlot religion, Revelation 17 and 18, that's rising up. Harlot Babylon that's ri ri uh, rising up is going to intoxicate the nations with delusion. 
And many Christians are going to fall for her delusion. Many, not a few. Many are going to fall for her delusion. That's why the Lord pleads in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, come out. An apostasy is coming like we've never witnessed. You know, and so it's the love of the truth. That's what we're going to talk about. That's the first session. It is the love of the truth that is the only safeguard in the end times. We have got to love the truth. Even if it hurts us, even if it offends us, even if it goes down to the very core of our being and prods at something we don't want to touch, the truth, we've got to love the truth. Because if, listen, if we don't love the truth, God himself sends a deluding influence upon us. That's, I mean, that's a hard thing. Not the devil. He'll use, the, the devil will be used. God himself will send a deluding influence upon us if we don't love the truth. And we're going to get into that in the next session. But understanding the end times keeps us from deception. And we're going to, and in fact, I'll talk about that in a minute, so we'll keep going. Number six, understanding the end times gives us faith and confidence. This is really important, okay? And I've, I've talked about a few negative things here deception and offense, but this is, really, this is really the positive here. Understanding the end times gives us faith and confidence. Jesus was saying about the end of the age, Luke 18, verse 8, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's tied into the great apostasy. That's tied into the great falling away. But the Lord asked, will he find faith on the earth? Now, I know I just said that's negative, but here's the good news. What I have found... This is just, just an amazing. When I study the end times and I take, it's really like putting together a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It really is. I mean, it's like doing the Rubik's Cube where you, you, know, you do all six sides together and it fits together perfectly. When you do that, when you look at how what Daniel wrote and what John wrote in Revelation and what Isaiah wrote and Zephaniah and Zechariah and Malachi and Hosea, all the different prophets and what they said. When you put that puzzle piece together and you see the way it fits over what, you know, however many years, 1,400 years, whatever the number is, I don't have it off the top of my head, that it took to write scripture or for the Bible to be canonized or the Bible to be finished, 1,400 years, whatever the exact number is, when, when you see that, oh, this, this time period over many different, I think 40 different authors over many different time periods, fitting together so perfectly, it puts you at all at God. Only God could have done that. Only God could have done that. Only, and it shows you the, the wonder of the scriptures. When, when, I, when I was studying the scriptures, and I just had this experience recently, studying the scriptures for so long and then seeing, goodness, the way Daniel fits perfectly with Revelation. And Revelation fits perfectly with Isaiah. And Isaiah fits perfectly with Zechariah. You just sit back in awe and say, look at God, to borrow a quote from Diane. Look at God. You just can't make it up. Number seven is, it gives you faith. It gives you incredible faith mountain-moving faith that you, you will not be shaken when you understand those things. Number seven, understanding the end times, this is very important, equips us to be a voice and an intercessor. Uh, I've been a charismatic for about 25 years or longer. I've been moving in the gifts for 25 plus years. So what I'm going to say does, is not meant to be like a slam on charismatic at all. I, I move in the gifts and have been moving the gifts for 25 plus years. But there's an incredible amount of deception right now in the prophetic movement. A deceiving spirit has entered the prophetic movement and it's related to eschatology. I'm telling you, the prophetic movement has become hijacked by a deceiving spirit. And that the root of it is as eschatology. What you believe about the end times. I want to say this. I, don't, I do not put much trust whatsoever in any so-called prophet or apostle who has error in their eschatology when it comes to prophesying about 
future events on a national or international level. Revival, America, whatever. I do not put much trust in that because if you have your eschatology wrong, if you have your end time doctrines wrong, it will affect how you prophesy. We need to learn from Daniel. Daniel was in, a, in the place of prayer. He was praying. He, was, he went and he took Jeremiah and he was reading through the prophecy of Jeremiah. In other words, Daniel himself as a prophet was a student of other prophets, student of eschatology. He was studying uh, Jeremiah and he realized, okay, the Lord said there's 70 years of captivity for Israel. That in and of itself was a motivation to Daniel to pray for God. Because he realized, okay, now that clock is now ticking and we're, we're really at the end of the 70 years. God, send the Jewish people back to Jerusalem and rebuild the holy city and all that. Daniel saw all that. And, and he, in other words, the prophetic scriptures fueled his intercession. The prophetic scriptures also fueled his prophesying. Because Daniel, we'll see this in another, I keep saying we'll see it in another, another session, and we will. Daniel took the 70 years of, or Gabriel came and visited Daniel, took the 70 years of, of Israel's captivity in Babylon and said, 70 sevens are determined for your people. In other words, because Daniel studied the end time prophets, God was then able to trust him as a pure voice the pure voice of a prophet to say now 77s are determined for your people. In other words, we cannot be an effective intercessor or an effective prophet or a messenger or in, to speak on behalf of God if our end time teaching is filled with errors. Beware in the prophetic movement. Beware in the prophetic movement of so-called words from God from people who are confused about the end times. And don't study the prophets. And don't study Revelation. And don't study Daniel and those kinds of things. Beware of that deception because there is much deception in the prophetic movement. But there's also a minority that God's raising up in the prophetic movement who do understand the end times and are prophesying the true word of the Lord. So now let me talk about, just to bring this to a close, let me just talk about real quick, and you know, every time I say real quick, it's never real quick, but let me just talk about real quick how this class is organized and how we're going to approach this class, this un class understanding the end times is th there's a lot of material we're going to go through. And so I've broken this class up into four different parts because each of these parts, you know, if you've ever had that experience where you're reading a book or you're hearing a teaching, you like that feeling of coming to the end of a chapter, you like that feeling of coming to the end of a course or the end of a book or whatever, is view this class as four mini courses within one overall course called Understanding the End Times. And so the, the first part is going to be, we're going to be dealing with scoffers and doctrines of demons. Um, when we get into this, it's going to be very important that we correct a lot of bad teaching that is now becoming popular and spreading in the charismatic movement in the church. Part two, we're going to talk about Israel, Islam, and the revived Roman Empire. And, you know, what you'll see is that Israel is at the center stage of what God is doing. Israel is at the center stage of what God is doing. Everything, now when I say that, the, the church obviously is what God's ultimate intention is. But God is using Israel as a prophetic catalyst to release the events of the, of the, of the uh, prophetic events into the earth. We're going to get into all of that. But you see it very, very clearly in Daniel 70 week prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel mentions 70 weeks, and then you see the last week, the last half of the last week, four or five times in the book of Revelation. So you've got to understand Daniel to understand uh, Revelation. And so we're going, to look at, we're going to look at Israel, Islam, and the revived Roman Empire in part two. It's very important. Part three, we're going to talk about God's ultimate intention fulfilled. See, even more important than how prophecy is being unfolded, even more important than how Israel is being restored, 
is God's ultimate intention. If Daniel's 70-week prophecy is the backbone of all end-time prophecy, then God's ultimate intention is the heartbeat of end-time prophecy. And so we're going to look at how the bride is made ready. We're going to look at how God's sons come to full maturity. And we're also in this section going to talk about the rapture. We're going to spend some time talking about the rapture, rethinking the rapture, really asking the question, okay, when is the church raptured? Is there a rapture? When is the church raptured? And so we're going to, we're going to go through that in a lot of detail. And then uh, part four is increasing birth pains and the day of the Lord. We're going to get into a lot of detail about the day of the Lord, the events leading to the day of the Lord, and then the ultimate day of the Lord, which will last for a thousand years, when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns from Jerusalem, and all the nations flock to him to hear him. So that's where we're going. That's where we're going in this class. I know there's a pretty lengthy introduction, but um, understanding the end times, we're going to look at, you know, we hit on a lot about deception and the love of the truth. And uh, in session one, we're going to open up with the love of the truth, which will be our next session. So I want to encourage you, uh, dig in, study, take this opportunity, and go deep in studying what the scriptures say about the end times. Amen.